Well, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak to you today about this really fascinating topic, which many of you already know something about. I'm, I'm not going to go over, I'm not going to spend an hour throwing the basics of this topic at you because some of you have already had uh, either uh, a talk about it or training about it or read about it or interested in it, maybe even just a news, a news story about the subject of implicit bias. We're going to cover some of the basics, but I want this to be less uh, lecture um, than I do, uh, as best we can in this sort of setting, a conversation about this topic. And so I encourage you to, throughout uh, the conversation today, interrupt me. This is something I never tell the kids, right? Please interrupt me uh, with questions, challenges, concerns, uh, issues that you want to discuss, and, and let's have a conversation about some of these really interesting topics. What a, that is such a goofy smile. I don't know where that picture came from. Um, so don't stop me if, if you've heard this one. A father and son are traveling um, on the highway and a tragic accident occurs and the father is killed and the son is rushed to the hospital with severe life-threatening injuries and needs surgery. And the trauma surgeon runs into the room and says, my God, I can't operate on this boy. That's my son. How can that be? Now, how many of you start thinking, how can that be? How many of you got it right away? That's his mother, is the trauma surgeon. How many of you have, as most people do, an implicit bias that doctors, trauma surgeons, that what you see is a male in that situation? Of course, in this day and age, I suppose it could be a gay couple, and it's also the father, right? Uh, it could be lots of things, but uh, that's a story that I told my kids a few years back, and. Uh, and it's an educational one. And then I told it to a group of their friends recently. And these are smart, right, Orville? These are smart uh, kids uh, who come from backgrounds where the parents, I think, were largely open-minded. And still, the image they had in their minds when I said the trauma surgeon rushed in the room and said, my god, I can't operate on that boy. That's my son. They sort of shook their heads and wait, wait, the father was dead. How could that be? Um, there's, there's an implicit bias about gender that still lives in our society despite the fact that it's 2016. I know that most of you woke up this morning and said to yourself, I want to spend my lunch hour listening to a middle-aged white guy talk about prejudice and bias in my life. I'm pretty sure you did. I, I, uh, And if, if that's what you woke up this morning thinking to yourself, this is your lucky day. So here I am. Um, but I would say it's fair to say that most of the people in this room, uh, and most of the people in any room I speak to, except, I suppose, Donald Trump's future cabinet. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to throw that in. You're probably going to guess at my politics anyway. So um, it's fair to say that uh, most of the people that I speak to about subjects like this, about discrimination, I'll tell you a little bit about my law practice in a minute as it relates to this topic. And at the end of the, uh, of the talk, I want to bring in the subject of employment discrimination cases and how they're proved and how implicit bias these days affects how we think about those cases and try to prove those cases and how sometimes it's such an obstacle to proving those cases. I'll get into that in a while. But uh, um, it's fair to say that most of the groups of people I speak to about these kinds of topics have had more life experience with the subject of discrimination prejudice than I do. They've lived it and they've experienced it perhaps many, many times. Um, but again, um, as, I, as I continue, uh, please feel free to interrupt with questions, concerns, or comments. Um, let me see a, ra uh, uh, um, a show of hands to start. How many of you have had some training or exposure on the subject of implicit bias? Let me see a show of hands. Great. Um, I think you mentioned to me, sir, that some of these uh, folks have had some, uh, have had a talk on this either here or uh, perhaps an HR training. So that's good. Uh, how many of you have implicit biases? Raise your hands up. <laughs> how many of you harbor explicitly racist and sexist beliefs? No. Don't raise your hands. That's not a question I would ask, but we know from solid scientific research on this, when I ask the question, how many of you have implicit biases, um, we know. We know that everybody should raise their hands. 
And how do we know that? Because the solid scientific research that's gone on for 20 years and more reveals that to one extent or another on one kind of topic or another, it could be race and gender, it could be things like um, national origin, it could be all kinds of things, that everybody harbors a certain level of implicit bias on certain of these things. Um, what is, an, and, and this is interesting, the, and that's the, the reason for the, the little cute little slide. Um, we know that implicit biases are often truly contrary to our conscious beliefs and values. We know that our conscious beliefs and values may truly, honestly, and sincerely not be biased, not be prejudiced about certain groups or certain types of people or whatever it might be, but that may, uh, in fact, our subconscious mind harbors implicit biases for reasons that we can talk about, uh, and there's a tug of war that goes on. And this is a little bit scary. We also know from the research that implicit biases sometimes control behavior and decisions more than we think. So, well, what kinds of decisions? And I want to bring this down to the, uh, the justice system level. Decisions about whom to prosecute or represent. Decisions about guilt or innocence or credibility. Decisions about civil liability and criminal sentences. Decisions that in the course of your jobs can have dramatically good or dramatically bad impacts on people's lives. And so today, um, I want to talk about in part, ah, this is an interesting quote from the Harvard uh, um, association, uh, implicit association test, which I'll talk about in a minute, and sort of reflects um, how deeply seated uh, these things can be. People may not say what's really on their minds because they're unwilling, that's more explicit, but because sometimes they are unable to do so because they don't even know. So, in the context of what might happen here in your building. I want to talk about attorney bias a little bit. I want to talk about juror bias. And I want to talk a little bit about judicial bias. Most of you have already had some information or training, but let's just do a few basics then. Um, implicit bias. Here's some basics. Implicit attitudes and stereotypes working together to create a range of possible judgments toward people, groups, or things. Um, this is from one of the, the studies that occurred in 2006. Um, it has been, as I said, the subject of studies for as much as 20 years. And the biggest study that has ongoing is the project implicit test. Uh, uh, primarily out of Harvard and Yale. Um, but the implicit assessment test, has anyone taken any of those tests online? Has anyone taken those tests? It's fascinating, isn't it? Um, what, could, tell me what, what to, I don't want to know the results, but tell me what tests you took particularly. Do you remember? Say, the race one, anybody else take different than race? The race one is the most often taken one, the gender one. Anybody take a test other than the race related one? Um, there are uh, a whole bunch of them, and here's what they find. 2.5 million completed tests found that these implicit and explicit preferences and stereotypes were widespread. Widespread. And widespread um, doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean, well, all uh, white people have implicit biases towards dark-skinned people. No, what it means is that all people have implicit, or almost all people, uh, whatever uh, race or color or gender, have implicit bias uh, when it comes to race. That are negative stereotypes about dark-skinned people. That's what these tests find. All people, men and women, uh, have some level, either almost neutral to strongly stereotypical or strongly biased, uh, implicit negative attitudes toward women and when it comes to stereotypes about women. Scary, isn't it? It's, uh, it, it? When you read some of these studies, you wonder how 
rational and non-prejudicial decision making gets made. At the end of the talk today, I want to talk about some of my thoughts uh, and, and share some others' thoughts about how do we confront these things? How do we address them in our daily lives? Because there are ways to do that, and there are success stories to share about that. So, but the science tells us certain things. Here are some of the things that it tells us. That they are pervasive. The biases are, they deviate, as I said, with the tug of war slide from, um, from our uh, explicit biases and beliefs, especially dealing with issues sensitive to our culture, those kinds of issues. Um, they may be more prevalent with the uncertainty, within the uncertainty of a trial setting. And I wanted to bring that one in from some of the studies to show how it relates to what goes on here in these buildings. And like explicit biases, implicit biases predict behavior. Not exactly, of course. Not entirely, of course. But they do. And that's the scary part. Um, I asked how many of you had taken uh, the various tests. Here they are. Um, I'll just put them up real quick. Um, there's a bunch of them, and they're fascinating. Uh, I've only taken a couple of them. Uh, the presidential candidates ones, I can't wait to take that one. I'm not quite sure what that one is. That's a newer one. Uh, but in any event, um, these tests are all available online if you're interested. Um, if you're interested in knowing where you, I don't know if it's rank is the right word, but where you fit on that scale of, you know, sort of neutral to strongly implicitly biased about certain things. But these are the tests that are available. Have these tests been scientifically validated? They have. Um, have they been repeated successfully multiple times as, as any good science is? They have. So we know they're, they're, they're valid. We know they're, they're real. And we know this exists. Um, the, um, the, the weapons test is particularly interesting when it comes to the criminal justice system, because what that testing shows is that um, that's a, that is uh, in part a race-related test, because what it, what it shows is that um, when it comes to, uh, and they do things like show a series of photographs, when it, it, there's a race bias towards thinking that what might be, what would be deemed a harmless object in the hands of a white person is in fact a dangerous weapon in the hands of an African American. Uh, not always, obviously, but there is a, there is a bias in that direction. Um, and that, of course, for any of you that have a job that relates to the criminal justice system, and many of you do, uh, that is certainly interesting to know. Well, this is another fundamental finding about these, about implicit bias, and that is encountering, when we encounter a person, we classify that person. Don't we do that anyway? I mean, let's being honest with ourselves for a second, and I don't mean we classify them in terms of racist or sexist or other kinds of stereotypes. I just mean we classify them. Everybody does it. You can be sure that jurors do it. I want to talk about that for a second. I worked for, uh, on, on, and have known for many years, a woman named Diane Wiley. Diane Wiley is one of the founders of a group called the National Jury Project. Uh, they're located in San Francisco and Minneapolis, and Diane's out of Minneapolis. And when I've had big, big cases where I can afford to do so, she'll come in and do jury work. She'll, she'll provide um, uh, you know, mock juries. We'll present the case to mock jury. She'll help us to, to pick a jury. It's the, it's the rare case where we can both justify that and afford to do it. Um, as you can imagine, it's an expensive thing to do. But it's, it's utterly fascinating. And she talks about, uh, she's been talking about implicit bias for many years. D Diane was um, famous, among other reasons. She was, the, she was the jury consultant on the very first criminal defense case where a woman was acquitted of murder based on the battered woman's defense syndrome, a syndrome and now a defense in murder cases that many of you have heard of and that is part of our culture and part of our jurisprudence now. And she, she was involved in that some 30, I think, years ago. Um, in any event, um, she 
she's, uh, and I'm going to talk more about juror bias in a second and how implicit bias relates to jurors and the work of jurors and what, what, what they're constitutionally required to do, which is, of course, be fair and impartial. Um, but she's, she's given me some, um, I'll just do some, some sound bites from Diane and her many years of work. She's told me things like, young people are poison on an age discrimination case jury. Young people are poison on those kinds of juries where someone is alleging age discrimination in employment. Why is that? She says, because they don't understand it, they don't get it, they can't relate to it, they don't believe it. Right? Now, She's never said that all white people are bad on, on a discrimination case involving an African American or, or a non-white person, um, but she said that's a, that's a tough one. Um, she's also told me, here's an interesting implicit bias soundbite, that uh, women who self-identify as feminists are really trouble on sexual harassment juries. Hello? <laughs> Wouldn't you think that if I were trying a sexual harassment case, I'd think on behalf of a woman who's alleged to have been sexually harassed, don't I think I'd want a whole bunch of feminists on the jury? She says, uh-uh, don't do it. Because what you run into is a fairly common kind of reaction like, well, what you should have done is hit him over the head with a chair and call the police, right? Toughen up. Um, it's just, it's really interesting. Anyway, that's a side, uh, a side note. So. I told you the little story about the trauma surgeon. Here's my uh, favorite stereotype, uh, stereotype um, uh, slide show or slide. Uh, pick the three felons, right? <laughs> Everyone, right? Somebody tell me the three felons. Somebody give me one of them. Martha, Martha yeah, of course, right? <laughs> she looks so nice, though. <laughs> How can she be a felon? That's an easy one. It's too easy. Yeah, it's true. See, I got you. See, I, I was trying to do a reverse one there because, yeah, back in the 1990s, he was convicted of possession of cocaine, which is a low level felony. What he mostly does now is uh, support the junior sports and coach of junior sports in California. Uh, who's the third one? So, this is a federal judge, I believe. That one was a college student. Just yeah, it has to be, right? Because this is a talk on implicit bias. That's the barefoot bandit. The kid who talked his way into, uh, among other things, he stole an airplane. Uh, anyway, uh, I had a bunch more of these, but I decided only to, to give you one of them. All right, so here's what we know. People are often unaware of their implicit biases. Ordinary people, including the researchers who direct this project, are found to harbor Implicit biases, even while honestly the reporting that they lack biases, right? But it is hard to argue, as I've said with the research, and here's my favorite piece on that, the one about the orchestra auditions. You wouldn't think that orchestra people would be biased, right? Nice people, classical people that play classical music, they're all nice people. They would certainly never self-identify as harboring sexist biases, but this is what happened. Uh, true story. So this is why I like the voice, right? They don't, well, of course, on the voice, they can hear whether it's a male or female, but they can't see anything else about the person, at least supposedly. I don't know if the show is rigged or not, but, but then they spin around and, and then they say, uh, just based on what they hear. All right. So implicit, who do you think said that? It's probably an easy guess because of our topic today, right? But this is my point about who harbors implicit biases. Reverend Jackson said that. Um, I was not going to guess Dr. Ben Carson. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this in the context of what goes on here a little bit. So let's talk about uh, implicit bias in a little more detail in terms of uh, the sorts of things that might go on here in the courthouse. So how many of you have some uh, direct involvement in the criminal justice system? How many of you in the room? Okay, a few. Uh, how many of you have some direct involvement in the civil justice system? A few more. Uh, juvenile, that includes juvenile, right? Um, can I tell my juvenile justice story? <laughs> 
um, I didn't come here just to tell little stories, but there's one that I do have to share. So when I was a young lawyer in the 1980s, one of the things I did was, in order to keep the lights on, because I just basically got out and hung a shingle, I wanted to do civil rights and employment litigation, which is what I do now. Talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, but one of the things I did was uh, juvenile criminal appointments. Um, and they paid uh, a $125 flat fee to represent a juvenile charged with a felony. Um, that dates me a little bit, I think. Um, but the second case that I ever was assigned was out of uh, East High School, and it was five African-American kids who had gotten into a scuffle, and one of them got a bloody nose, one of them got a bruise, nobody was seriously hurt, but they were all arrested and charged with aggravated riot. And it really got me thinking, of course, at the time, about the prosecutor's decision to charge these five kids with aggravated riot, which is a felony. Um, it seemed to me that if this had occurred at Upper Arlington High School, and I said this is the prosecutor, but right before he threw me out of the office, his office, that had this been at Upper Arlington High School, they would have been charged with either nothing or misdemeanors, but not a felony, not aggravated riot for what really was just a schoolyard scuffle. I will say that the juvenile magistrate, um, who's not in this room, um, re since retired, uh, agreed with our presentation at trial and eventually found a couple of the kids guilty of assault and dismissed the charges on the rest of them, or uh, judged them delinquent, I guess was the, the term at the time. I don't know if that's still the term, is it? So, um, and so uh, I was glad that that had a, uh, uh, the right result. But it struck me at that time and still strikes me that you know, prosecutors' decisions, which as most of you or many of you should know, are nearly unreviewable. Unre Charging decisions are nearly unreviewable. There's, there's tremendous prosecutorial discretion and legal immunity from their decisions and probably should be. I mean, I'm not arguing the philosophical point. I'm not gonna suggest that prosecutors should, that, that, that they shouldn't have a, a lot of discretion in making these decisions. But charging decisions can certainly be affected. So they face choices in all stages of a criminal case, right? From, from not just from the charging decisions, but also um, whether to charge, what crime to charge for, uh, pretrial strategies so, such as whether to contest bail um, or to offer a plea bargain. When you're talking about the decision whether to contest bail, um, you're trying to decide is someone dangerous is someone hostile, is someone aggressive? Those three kinds of stereotypes are the kinds of stereotypes that are, and we know from the implicit bias studies, far more likely to be attributable to people of color than white people. Um, and so decisions whether to offer a plea bargain, uh, certainly important, and then trial strategy like, like jury selection. So, we know from the studies that have been done uh, that prosecutors are more likely to charge black suspects than white suspects. And the implicit association test studies, those 2.5 million some studies show that people implicitly associate African Americans with guns and other weapons and disassociate whites and weapons. And other studies show that um, African American or white defendants receive more favorable plea bargains than minority defendants. So implicit biases, I have no doubt that there are places in this country, because that's what I do for a living, is sue for discrimination in civil rights cases, and I see it. Uh, but I have no doubt that there are places where there are explicitly hostile and or sexist and or racist and or use whatever term you want people who have jobs as prosecutors, I'm sorry to say, but I don't think there are many. Um, the problem that is far more difficult to wrestle with is the problem of implicit biases. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, we know that studies show that in analyzing um, court reports of juvenile offenders, researchers found frequently more uh, ascribed African-American youth delinquencies to negative personality characteristics. That's another study that's been done. So implicit bias in the court systems certainly has an impact when it comes to 
uh, attorney bias and prosecutors. It has an impact when it comes to defense counsel. If you're representing someone, I had some experience when I was a young lawyer in criminal defense. I mentioned the juvenile case. Uh, certainly uh, uh, the decision or the thought process, you know, frequently your criminal defendant isn't going to admit to you that they committed the crime. But as a defense counsel, you kind of want to know if you have obviously compelling evidence that they did, that they are guilty, you can't have them testify that they didn't, but let's just assume it's one of those you don't really know. But your thought process in deciding to yourself how to handle this case, you have to, you make a judgment about whether they are or they aren't. You just do. Um, jury selection is important. Um, civil counsel, uh, that bias relates to uh, jury selection uh, as well, witness credibility, and, and all kinds of decision making. Another really important area where uh, implicit bias has an impact is with our juries. So I was telling you about my friend Diane Wiley in Minneapolis. A really important thing that um, that organization, the National Jury Project studies have shown, is that jurors make decisions about guilt or innocence, and they make decisions about um, uh, civil liability very early on in trials. They shouldn't, that's not what they're supposed to do, but they often do. Um, and sometimes those decisions are affected by implicit bias, not always. And it's not always a decision based on bias by any means. I happen to be one of those optimistic sorts that really believes strongly that the jury system works and works incredibly well. Um, in fact, uh, one of my associates was on a jury, I don't know how he ever got seated, but he was on a civil jury here last week and came back absolutely overflowing with uh, good things to say about how that whole process worked and how the jury um, you know, how, the, how great a job the jury did and how they really did the job that they were supposed to do. But we know from the National Jury Project studies and other studies that jurors do make decisions early. They don't make it because they walk in a room and see somebody. It's the rare juror that does, an unfortunate juror who does that. But we do know that they make decisions pretty early on and we know because of that that they judge parties by appearance in part and judge witnesses by appearance and witness credibility and decide who deserves what, decide guilt or innocence in, in criminal cases. So one member of the um, federal judiciary recently wrote an article. It is a, uh, you, you all work in the state system. Um, I practice a lot in federal court and it has been in the last 15 years especially a huge shift in the way that voir dire is conducted in federal courts. What happens in federal courts now is the judges whip through a whole bunch of series of canned questions and then they let you do a little bit of follow-up. That's the typical voir dire. Well, there's starting to be some writing and some thinking otherwise, right? Because, why? Because of all the studies and the information that's coming out about implicit bias. And there's a, re a federal judge who recently wrote a well-regarded law review article who s said that he wanted a the attorneys to really do the voir dire and spend a lot of time on it and focus on this question of implicit bias. And in fact, there's even some judges that have allowed some of these implicit association tests to be, that's my daughter texting me. <laughs> she said, Never mind, I'm not going to tell you what she said. <laughs> We're having a tussle about, you know, does she have to go to her tennis lesson before her softball game? So, one of those, really important stuff. So, my answer is yes, her answer is no, we'll see how that plays out. Um, the the, um, the, uh, uh, the judge uh, thinks that attorneys should conduct the voir dire, but, he, but some judges, as I said, have even authorized Jury pools being administered these IAT tests. Not so much to just, okay, if you don't score certain X, you're excluded. I don't think that's appropriate, but instead to kind of get people thinking and talking about it. Why? We'll come back to this in a few minutes. Because if you're thinking about these things, which is part of the purpose of today's talk, you can address them. This isn't, you know, please. Yeah, 
Sure. But isn't it the job of a prosecutor or even a defense attorney to exploit the, 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 the bias? I it's mean, a that, great that, question. That, that, that's what it is. I mean, if, if you want right. to be a good defense attorney, you're going to pick a jury that, that you want to rule in your favor. And if you're a good prosecutor, you're going, in a murder case, you're going to pick people from the Buckeye, uh, Buckeye Steel industry right. who are infamous for, for being generally more biased towards bias. So, Right. Isn't that the nature of the beast that you can, can you avoid it? You're right. exploiting it. Right. Well, I don't, I mean, ultimately, I don't think we avoid it, but right. it's a great question, which is, isn't it the job of the advocate, that is, picking the prosecution versus the defense case, for the, them to do whatever they can? Well, yes and no, in this sense. So prosecutors are constitutionally bound not to, um, uh, for example, if, who's heard of the Batson case? the U.S. Supreme Court case where it is unconstitutional for prosecutors, or defense lawyers for that matter, if they want to, to exclude persons from juries ba on the basis of race, right, to pick them. That's the Batson case. It's an imperfect way of trying to address this problem, but it's out there. So prosecutors aren't supposed to do that. And here's the thing, conscientious prosecutors don't in the sense that they don't say, I'm going to try to get this person convicted by making sure that I've got more, I don't know, racists on the jury. I mean, they're not oh, supposed well, to do that. Not like that. Yeah, but here's, here's where the implicit bias problem comes in. Um, they're thinking about things like what crime to charge, uh, who to pick on the jury, all of those things, with those implicit leanings, uh, not knowing that they have them, even if they are honestly and sincerely, remember the tug of war slide, not believing that they act that way. Now, does that mean we're all deep, deeply racist and there's nothing we can do about it? Well, no, that's not the point of these studies. But are there leanings in that direction that we all have to one degree or another from you know, close to neutral to some people strongly? Yes, we do know that. And once we know that, though, we can consciously begin to address it. We do know that. Now, defense lawyer trying to get somebody off, are they going to use whatever they can if they feel like they need to get somebody off? I don't think that's going to change dramatically, no. I mean, but I do think we need to have systems in place. And that gets me to my last point about this, which is this particular federal judge, who I won't read you from his law review article, which is like you know 80 pages long. Um, but he argues that the Batson case doesn't go far enough, that we need to have stronger safeguards in place to avoid sort of the stereotyping that goes on in picking juries. And one of the things he's suggesting is that in the right case, even using these tests or some modified version of these tests to, to help you pick your jury pool, which is fascinating. I don't think that's going to sweep the country. <laughs> I don't think our federal or state judiciary is sort of going to say, oh, implicit biases are out there. Let's solve this problem by getting rid of one of these tests. But it's a tool that might be used in some places. So. Um, in any event, um, judges, of course, like everyone else, harbor their own uh, biases. Surprise, surprise. Um, not, uh, not magistrates, of course, uh, Doug. Yeah, no. Yes. Uh, but this is, the, um, this is Judge Mark Bennett who wrote the article I was talking about, the federal judge. So here he was saying, I was so eager to take the test and I knew I would, quote, pass with flying colors. I didn't. Um, and that sort of, of course, fits with, uh, with our, um, our story. I'm going to tell you where I got this. Right? Uh, uh, you can kind of read this for yourself. But what this is, is um, a comparison over a long period of time uh, of Tra sentencing for um, African Americans for uh, tra trafficking in drugs um, and white offenders for trafficking in drugs. And the difference in the sentencing data um, was 101 months of incarceration versus se about 70 months of incarceration. Right? Uh, a lot of data went into this. Um, and then um, this is um, a different judge. Uh, in the same county. Now, where did I get this? This is a pending affidavit of disqualification before the Ohio Supreme Court. I won't say which county. It ain't Franklin County. Um, but this, there's a judge in this particular county who has these stats. And then the judge that they compared them to has these stats. 
very little, very little difference. Um, and it, we're not talking about a half a dozen sentencings here. We're talking about tons of them. So the data set is pretty large. So this is a meaningful comparison. I can't imagine that this particular judge harbors, although I can't imagine, I don't want to imagine <laughs> that this particular judge harbors explicitly racist views. I suspect this is really an issue of implicit bias. Um, and by the way, they controlled this data for things like prior record and all those things, right? This is not, this is not just, well, it must be because, you know, the African American defense had something else, you know, no. This is all controlled for that stuff. And, and I suspect, I suspect folks, that if you did this kind of study in every county in this state, all 88 counties, you're going to see more of this. Because this is about implicit bias. I don't think, I hope, I hope, this is not about explicitly racist viewpoints. This is about people who honestly would say to themselves, I'm not that way. I treat everyone fairly. It's very fascinating. I don't know where that affidavit disqualification is going to come out. I haven't heard anything about it since I pulled up that stuff. So um, judicial bias, of course, can relate to sentencing, how they deal with attorney conduct, evidentiary rulings, and my uh, least favorite topic, summary judgment. Um, and that leads me to talk a little bit about, um, about what I do. Um, if you're at all interested. So uh, let me get to that. Um, what I do for uh, a living, for the most part, is uh, represent employees in employment cases of various kinds, including predominantly employment discrimination cases. Uh, I also do civil rights litigation um, where government, whether it be police or whatever government agency, violates someone's First Amendment rights or their Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights, or the right to be free of excessive force, or whatever it might be. Uh, I cause trouble, basically. That's what I do, and I enjoy it. The, the, um, the work of doing employment discrimination has changed in the 30 years that I've been doing it. And it's changed in part because I think people's, I believe, optimistically perhaps, uh, I believe in evolution, right? I believe uh, and, uh, that people are slowly but surely getting better. I think people that slowly but surely are getting less biased, less prejudiced as our society grows and as people learn to about other people and live with other people and get to know other people. Uh, I believe all that. So, you know, chalk me up as a na naive optimist, but I am. Uh, but what I've seen in, in the 30 years I've been practicing is far, far less direct evidence discrimination cases where we have, oh my gosh, when I was first practicing law, the, you know, the race discrimination cases involving, you know, just explicit racial slurs and really awful stuff, they were there. I'm not saying there were tons and tons of them, but they were there. We rarely see that these days. Um, are people just being more cautious and still harboring these beliefs? Yes, sometimes. But are there fewer people who are uh, willing to engage in that kind of behavior? I also believe that. Um, and the um, uh, e e sexual harassment cases have declined to some extent as people get m at least more education and training or at least more companies are paying closer attention to it and, and making sure that they take action, prompt and effective action when something like that occurs. So I've seen significant changes and, and improvements from where I sit in government and private employers. I deal mostly with private employers, uh, but also represent employees who are employees of government agencies. But we also know this. This is one of many recent tester studies. Um, this one was done, this is UCLA Law Review in 2012, so it's a, you know, a four-year-old plus study, but um, probably the study itself started five or six years ago. I understand it's not that recent, but it's a good one because it's pretty comprehensive. And it wasn't just in California. It looked across various places in the country. And it was, an, it was a hiring study where testers were sent in. And you know how testers work, right? You sent in the white person with the exact same qualifications followed by the a minority person with the exact same qualifications followed by the white person. You know, you, 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 the testing is 
uh, how they do it is pretty well documented and pretty well set. Um, and it's still the case that in hiring, we see a net rate of discrimination depending on geographic area and other factors of between 20 and 40 percent. Right? We still see that women or minorities or whatever subgroup you're dealing with, whatever the test group is, um, and it varies depending on test group, of course, we still see that they get hired 20 to 40 percent less. Is that because of overt, blatant, you know, sexism, racism, and homophobia, homophobia whatever, you, whatever the situation is, in uh, employers? I don't think so, so much. There's some of that, of course. I think it's more about what we've been talking about. I think it's more about implicit bias. Um, and so in my work, there's a change in, um, uh, there's been a change, and this, this is a, um, a slide will set up what I'm talking about uh, in, in the cases that we see and how we prove those cases. Now, in one sense, we're fortunate that the law allows us to prove discrimination without having to have some kind of blatant, explicit, direct evidence. Um, and absent direct evidence, we use the McDonnell Douglas as a reference to a famous United States Supreme Court decision from a zillion years ago where they set up the schema. Uh, or the process for proving employment discrimination. I have people come in my office all the time and they say, you know, I really think I got fired because I'm too old or I, I, you know, whatever it might be, but I don't know how you prove it. Well, I say, well, let me tell you the ways in which we think about these cases and the ways in which we can prove them. So in one sense, this, these old laws, the Civil Rights Act, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of um, 1964, they go back many, many years but in, in some ways, they're set up to allow us to deal with this difficult question of implicit bias um, because they allow us to prove these cases by proof of pretexts. So without going into a lot of boring detail about how employment discrimination cases are proven, I can tell you that uh, just I'll use the age discrimination as a good example uh, in a termination case. A prima facie case would be the person was within the protected class 40 or over is the protected class for age discrimination, although 40 seems young to me these days, sir. I'm just saying. Um, the the uh, protected class, by, by the way, I have to, this is a side. A thousand times since I've practiced law, there'll be some white person sitting in my office, a white male usually, and they go, well, I know I'm not a member of protected class, so there's nothing I could do. And I go, where did you get this, right? Race discrimination is against the law. Yes, we have a history of oppression and discrimination against minorities, and that's why we have these laws. And yes, in history, most of the discrimination has occurred against minorities, but race discrimination is against the law. So my friend, my white male friend, you are a protected class. You cannot be fired because of your gender or your race, uh, and so on. Age is the only one, by the way, that's different. There is no uh, law that says if you're 32 and the person says, you're fired because you're too young, you look like you're about 29, so I'm going to point at you. Um, so, you know, you're t however old you are, don't tell me, but, okay, well, you're right, close. Um, uh, you know, you're fired because you're too young for this job. That's not illegal. It's, it's not. Uh, but if you were quite a bit older than you are, if you were 40 and they said you're too old to do this job, that is illegal. So unlike race and all the other, is, you know, isms, um, age is the only one that has a, protected, a specific protected class. All right, so the prima facie case. A uh, person's fired from the job, they're over 40, they're 40 or over, um, and they were replaced by a person who's uh, substantially younger. And in our parlance, in our law, um, the, the um, uh, substantially younger generally means 10 years or more. So a person's uh, 55, they're fired, replaced by somebody who's 35, uh, uh, and you have your prima facie case, and then the employer is supposed to articulate a legitimate non-discriminatory reason, and that can be anything, it, it, as long as it's you know, generally legitimate. It could be usually the, it's what? It's usually the work performance or the conduct or some combination of both. There's usually some articulated reason. That burden on the employer is a really easy one to meet. All they gotta do is say something that sounds legitimate. I've only had like two cases in 30 years where the employer couldn't gin up a reason it was sad. I guess their lawyers were really bad. They couldn't come up with anything. Um, you know, their, their, their reason, I had a case once where the reason they stuck to almost a trial where we settled it was, 
well, we don't have to give you a reason because it's employment at will. I love that, right? Um, most of you are government employees, so you're not at will employees. Lucky for you, at least some due process rights. They're, they're, they're modest, but some due process rights apply to you uh, as government employees. Um, at least the opportunity to have a predisciplinary hearing. Uh, most employees don't have that. But, um, but to get to my point, right, in the employment discrimination laws, how do we wrestle with this implicit bias problem? Well, we, we do it by proof of discrimination by proof of pretext. That is, pre meaning the articulated reason is just a pretext for discrimination. If we can show that the articulated reason has no credibility, right? This person committed misconduct, and we can prove that they didn't. Or this person's performance stunk, and we can prove that it wasn't. I've had many cases involving salespeople, for example, where they said, well, the performance is no good, and then we get all the data, we get all the information, and we show that they're you know, in the middle, or they're, they're doing well in terms of their sales. Um, timing, of course, is important, um, particularly in retaliation cases where someone complains about discrimination and is fired, the timing is important. Did the employer violate its own policy in what they did? Did they follow their policies in what they did? Uh, and then comparables, meaning you know, how were similarly situated employees treated who are alleged to have the same performance problem or the same conduct problem? Like, well, you know, we fired so-and-so because they, you know, they had um, inappropriate material on their computer. Or in the case of government employees, and I know none of you have ever done this, that you have um, personal stuff on your uh, work computers. Um, uh, and then we find out that, well, every employee has that. And, and they don't really do deal with it. So that's, that's just an example of what we mean by comparables. So the schema is there. Um, the practice has changed. The practice has changed a lot um, because we rarely see the explicit, blatant discrimination evidence of that stuff. What we see is, is suspicion of discrimination. And here's some of the ways in which we prove it. Sure. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, the question is, you know, you have to be fired to have a discrimination case. No, you can have a hiring case, failure to hire. Here's what the law says about that. Um, you can, it, you, can ha you have to have some tangible job detriment, an adverse action of some kind. So that can be not hiring, firing, failure to promote, demotion, um, in extreme cases, bad evaluations. And that have to be extreme, like, you know, almost ready to be fired kind of situation. And then the infamous hostile environment, and since we have like three minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover that real quick. Everybody knows about this phrase, hostile work environment. Very few people understand that it's not something you can sue over unless it is because of one of the things that's protected in the law. It is unlawful to discriminate on the basis of Pregnancy, national origin, race, gender, religion, age, uh, color. I'm missing one, I think. Somebody should tell me which one I'm missing. Gender, thank you. And sexual orientation, by the way, is not against the law in state or federal. I happen to believe it should be, but it is not at present time. The city of Columbus has an ordinance against it. The ordinance is um, not enforceable in court. It's simply the Human Relations Commission does its thing, and then whatever they do, they do. I don't think it has a whole lot of teeth, frankly. But the sexual orientation is not. There is some good case law being developed arguing that sexual orientation is really a, a type of gender discrimination. And the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has recently taken a position saying that, for the most part, they think it is. So I'm going to. I think that law will develop internally. If I certainly don't think the state legislatures are prepared. To, to uh, pass those kinds of law, or most of them, most of them are not. Um, that has to do with politics. Imagine that. Um, so, hostile environment, real quick. It is not illegal to live in a work environment where hostility occurs, unless, of course, it's physical violence or something. It's not. It's not a hostile environment. It's only a hostile environment legally actionable if it's severe pervasive, 
and it's based upon one of the illegal things, pregnancy, race, gender, religion, and so on. Got it? I'm not trying to talk you out of complaining about workplace problems. I'm just telling you that in terms of what you can sue for. I got one minute left to talk about overcoming explicit bias. So I'll do this real quick. Um, these are my thoughts about it. Um, I think heightening awareness, which we've all just done, um, exposing ourselves to individuals that are different, um, which happens more and more in our society. When I grew up, I grew up in Southern California. You could tell I was a surfer dude, right? Um, I grew up in Southern California, but in the middle of high school, my father moved to uh, Columbus, Ohio, and I finished high school at beautiful Reynoldsburg High School. It was a fine high school. We had three African Americans in my high school class. If you go to Reynoldsburg now, it's, it's a significantly different uh, community. Um, and I don't remember I don't remember talking to any of them. I don't even remember who they were, their names, or what they looked like. I just remember there were three in my entire class. So how do we expose ourselves to individuals? Well, the world is changing, luckily. Um, but I certainly didn't do it in high school. And then engaging in rather than deliberate, off-the-cuff decision-making and providing reasoned explanations for decisions, which we hope all our judges do. Um, there was a recent book, I'll wrap it up with this uh, comment. There's a, uh, a few years ago, there's a book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. And it's a fascinating book, but Gladwell argued that uh, sometimes um, the decisions we make like that are the best decisions, right? That's interesting, it's fascinating, and I think it's probably true to some extent, but it's, it's also not good in other ways. Because sometimes the decisions we make like that are decisions that are influenced by implicit biases that we all have to one extent or another. So that's why I think the third point is a, is a good one. Well, uh, again, I'll let you get out of here. If anyone wants to stick around and ask questions, happy to talk um, and happy to have done this today. Where you go, because you know you can walk out as you, as you need. Um, any questions for him? They want to get, it's one o'clock, they want to go. Um, because I know we, we talk about how this impacts our, our world, we talk about how it impacts our human resource department. We, um, what are some of the, uh, the challenges that you face when um, trying to prove implicit bias in your, right. when you're uh, practicing? Right, well, what I know is that implicit bias exists and I know that we have to deal with it with Everything from our clients to jurors to judges to opposing counsel to uh, uh, convincing, most important in my world, convincing a judge that the case is worthy of a jury trial to get past summary judgment. So um, I'm not trying to prove implicit bias so much as that I'm trying to prove using one of those. Um, oh, it's not going back. There we go. I'm trying to prove one of the things that helps us to prove pretext. That's the best I can do. But what I do want to do is convince judges now that implicit bias exists and that it influences decision making. And that's where all this science has been helpful. So we're starting to, as part of our briefing, we're starting to show judges some of this stuff. Um, some of them are receptive to it and others are not. So what type of exercises or training have you come across to allow yourself to kind of rid yourself or to uh, limit yourself of bias, implicit bias? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is just recognize that it exists and it is real and then it has some influence over your decision making. Once you do that, because I would guess, I would hope everybody in this room sincerely does not want to have biases and prejudices against people who are different than we are. Every, you know, almost everybody I run into really honestly and sincerely feels that way. Um, so once you, once you think through this, uh, you think through the subject of implicit bias, you think about it, that I think by itself goes a long way. There's a study, but there, I should I wanted to mention this is a study of, of um, <clears throat> where judges did some sort of groundwork training with implicit bias um, <clears throat> and what they found themselves doing was consciously um, trying to address that in their sentencing and criminal sentencing and they started to see a difference in sentences they were correct they were self-correcting 
Um, you remember that slide with the significant disparity, w over 30 months disparity in the sentence or white versus African American uh, drug trafficking defendants? No. Yeah. So, yes? What about people who say, well, you know what, I, it's not implicit bias, I'm just a butt, right? I'm just mean to everyone, or that's just my style. How do you then show that, no, you're particularly. Um, that's, that's what I tell my employees. I'm just a, I'm just a jerk, all around. jerk all around, yeah. It's not bias. Well, that's just not so. I mean, the whole, because implicit bias is the sort of thing that you're unable to know. And, you, and even taking the test doesn't even necessarily say, aha, I have, you know, three degrees of implicit bias, and therefore I just need to self-correct three degrees. It doesn't really work that way. It's not that simple. Um, but we know that there's no such thing as a equal opportunity jerk because of implicit bias. There just isn't. Um, and again, most people are on the, you know, modestly biased. There are people that, are, that test strongly for it. And the tests aren't exact, I'll give you that. I mean, they're not perfect any more than the, this, that, that psychology is a perfect, uh, a perfect science, but. Well, John, we actually have, I'm sorry about that. We actually have someone waiting since we moved room. We would have had a little more time, so they have to go. Um, I would try to see if we can bring them back and have more of a discussion instead of this type of um, presentation. Uh, it was good that we laid the groundwork, but discussion is really what we want to go into. Sometimes we need to get comfortable with it. So I think he's comfortable with it. Yeah, I think we are. Most, I know most of you. Mean, so uh, we'll try to do that. So thank you very okay, much. You're welcome. Thank you.